So remember our message on sola scriptura, God's word alone. Um, we remember that we believe and follow in the word of God as the highest standard and the highest authority for all things. And, but why is that, right? We have to know why and, and also have assurance that the Bible truly is the word of God. So there are two verses that are very powerful in teaching us why we should trust the word of God. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. Let's read it out loud wherever you are. Ready? All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Yes. All scripture inspired by God. All. So that's so important that we believe that, that we're not just talking about part of the scriptures, but all of it. So let's let's read John 17 as well, right? Use the truth to make them holy. Your word is truth. Yes, this is Jesus's own prayer. And the only way that I can become holy and I can become closer to Christ, be changed and transformed into the image of Christ is through the word of God, not through anything else. Not through your service, not through your good works, not through all the singing that you do right at church. It's through the word. Only the word has the transforming power because it's inspired by God. And like we just read, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training. So everything that we need to change and grow in our knowledge and image of Christ is there. So in the... Westminster Catechism, there are questions that help us understand biblical doctrine. This is question number two. Do you remember question number one? What is the chief end of man? Right? What's the purpose of life? And the answer was to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Then the second question is so connected, which is what authority from God directs us how to glorify and enjoy him? Because you can say, I'm glorifying God by robbing this bank so that I can give money to the church, <laughs> right? So what? What? Do, how do we know that's not right? Because the Bible teaches us that robbing a bank is a sin, right? So we have to actually know what is the way that we know how to glorify God. And the banter, let's read it together. The only authority for glorifying and enjoying him is the Bible, which is the word of God and is made up of the Old and New Testaments. It's very simple, right? The simple statement of the only authority is the Bible, not the words of the pastor, not the words of the Pope, not the words of the church or the state. It's the word of God. And then the third question right after that is, what does the Bible primarily teach? So what is it telling us? The answer? Ready? The Bible primarily teaches what men must believe about God and what God requires of men. So it's two things. What do we have to know about God? What do we have to believe? Because we have to have the correct understanding of God and he reveals himself through the word of God. But also we have to know what God wants from us. So it's twofold. The more you know God, of course, the more you will know yourself because you're made in the image of God. The more you know yourself, you'll know more about God because he created you. So we have to have these things put together. Okay, so those are the two very important questions. Then let's move on to this. What does it mean that God's word is truth? There are certain things, characteristics about the Bible that we all believe. First, inspired by the Holy Spirit. This whole page, there are a few bullet points. Let me ask Elsa to read them as I pull them down. Okay, could you do that? Okay, second one. Inher inheritant always tells the truth. Inerrant. Inerrant always tells the truth. Number three. Infallible, never wrong. Mm -hmm. Ultimate. Authority and standard for life. Yes. One more. 
sufficient to know God's will. Yes. Do you believe this? Yes. Amen. Do you believe it's inspired Amen. by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you believe the word of God is inerrant? There's no yes. mistake about it. It's always telling the truth. Do we believe that it's infallible? Yes. Do we believe it's the ultimate authority and standard for life? And do we believe that it's sufficient to know God's will? Why is this so important? Because I think people, they don't believe this and that's why they seek answers outside. They're looking for prophets. They're looking for prophecies, miracles. They're looking for, you know, fortune tellers even sometimes. They're not happy and they're not satisfied with the word of God. Let's talk about a little more facts about the word of God. June, can you go and read these? Most historically verified ancient document in history. Yes, that's a truth. Historically verified ancient document. That means there's so many copies of the exact same document, all written at the same time. So let's read the second one. The Bible was written and verified within the lifetime of eyewitnesses to its events. Mm. So it's not written hundreds of years later where nobody can say, hey, that's not wrong. I mean, that's not right. They were written so that if it was incorrect, people will have to uh, refute that. They would fact check it, right? 2,500 prophecies in the Bible, 2,000 prophecies fulfilled perfectly 100%. That's pretty impressive, right? But what's wrong? Why is it 100% in terms of 200, 2,500? Because the 500 is not yet fulfilled. Because they're all prophecies about the end times. And then the, and this one? 40 different authors from different countries and cultures over 1,600 years. <laughs> How is it that they could all talk about the same theme? It's not a man's doing. It can't be just what some humans, few people put together. It, it just goes beyond human effort. And there's also one more page full of facts. Grace, could I ask you to read these? Written in three languages, Hebrews, Aramaic, Aramaic, Aramaic Greek. Good. Archaeology. Archaeology supports Bible facts. Mm hmm Sciences does not contradict the Bible, but overwhelmingly confirms it. Yes, the more science discoveries there are, the more we see that the Bible was right all along. <laughs> and they think that science and Bible are contradictory, but it's not. There's nothing that the Bible says that is scientifically incorrect. It's so crazy, right? World's best-selling book over six billion. Mm -hmm. Still the number one selling book in the world. <laughs> and lastly. Translated into over 1,000 languages. Yeah, that's so impressive. Now, it's not necessarily the whole entire Bible, but the 1,000 languages is at least some parts of the Bible have been translated. And we're still in the process of translating to all the different languages. So it's so amazing, the word of God. So let's go over some of the Bible books. So if you have your Bible with you, it'll be a good project for us to kind of review. What are these books? This is, again, this, this, this lesson today is the overview. 39 books are in the Old Testament. The first five books are called Pentateuch which is just the books of Moses, okay? They're written by Moses all around 1400 BC, before Christ. So this is when Moses was alive, very, very early on in world history. And there are five books that he wrote. So what are those books? What's the first book? Anybody? <laughs> this is the easier one. <laughs> Anybody? Genesis. Genesis, yes, which actually means beginning. Genesis actually mean, means beginnings. Second one. Exodus. Exodus. God's deliverance from Egypt. And Exodus means exit, right? So the way that they came out of Egypt, set free from slavery, it's the, the whole story of how he did that. And then the third book, starting with L, 
Leviticus. 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 And it's really the story of the tribe of Levi, but it's centered around them because it's all about God's atonement, blood sacrifices, holiness requirements, and also how to worship. So these are all really, really powerful stories of what God requires for worship. And we might think that it's so legalistic, but actually throughout all of those laws that are being given, undergirded in all of that is the covenant of grace. Because if God didn't show us grace, we would all die. But he's giving us a chance to be forgiven through blood sacrifice. And all of that is pointing to Jesus, isn't it? And even with Exodus, the story of the deliverance, Passover, what's that pointing to? Jesus later on. I mean, every single book is telling us about that. But we have to also know the stories to appreciate that. What is the fourth book of the Bible? Numbers. 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 And these book, these, this is also storytelling, but also written writing all the numbers of the Jew, the Israelites by tribes. But it's really the story of God's people wandering in the desert for 40 years. They kept disobeying God, worshiping idols, and it's a story of their disobedience, really. Finally, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And this is a long message of Moses given to the Israelites, warning them and preparing them to enter Canaan land. So these five books, we share these five books with the Torah as well, right? Which is the Jewish Bible. They also have the very same, very, very same passages. But it's so interesting how they haven't, be, they were not, they're not able to see how the books of Moses were all fulfilled through Jesus. Okay. Does anybody know the next set of books? What what's kind of is it's considered as the next set of books, starting with Joshua. It's called the books of history. The books of history. Okay. So there are 12 books of history, and it's all talking about God's covenant with Israel. These were written between 1400 and 450 BC. So of a span of a thousand years, a thousand years of these stories, starting with what's the next book after Deuteronomy? Joshua. Yes, Joshua. And he's this story of Joshua is how Israel entered into Canaan and conquered all the lands. But after he died, Israel forgot the covenant. And that's where the story of judges come in. And we hear all these stories of several judges who judged Israel for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And whenever there was a good judge, the Israelites would follow and obey God. And when, when the judges died, they would fall back and worship idols again. It's like the cycle of holding to covenant, breaking the covenant, holding to the covenant, breaking to the covenant. Um, and then somewhere in between, there's a the next story, the story of number three. Anybody? Yeah, Ruth. It's Ruth. Okay. The story of Ruth. And it's such a beautiful kind of insertion of the story of this Canaanite woman from Moab who followed her mother-in-law. What was the mother-in-law's name? Naomi. Naomi. Yes. She followed Naomi and Naomi didn't really, you know, really follow the covenant. She moved out of the land of Israel and married, you know, and had her sons marry non-Jewish people. But somehow she comes back with Ruth and it's the love story between her and who is it again? Boaz. Boaz. Yeah. So it's a cool story, but it's really just, again, filled with covenant themes because Boaz and Ruth gets married and then they have a child. What's his name? I think his name is Obed. And then Obed has a kid. His name is? Is that Jesse? Jesse. Yeah. Eventually, Jesse has seven sons. Um, and David is one of them. So such a beautiful story. Then we go into first and second Samuel. Lots of history there. Talk about Hannah and, you know, how she had Samuel. He was dedicated. Then we go into first and second Kings. A lot of the stories kind of, you know, inter interlock um, or 
they kind of overlap. First and second chronicles, those are also stories of kings. And then they get, they fall into captivity to Babylon. Sad story, but it's part of Israel's history. Then we see number 10. It's a, it's a book during the time when God called Israel to come back and come back to Jerusalem. It is Ezra. Yeah, so it's Ezra's story and Nehemiah. These two people were very important in helping to rebuild the temple of Israel, restoring the covenant. And God said, hey, I'm going to bring you back. He really did keep his promise 70 years later. And then finally, the last book in the book of history is a story of she was a queen. Oh, yeah. Esther. Yeah. Queen Esther, the queen in Persia at the time. So all of these books of history all kind of connect with the same theme concerning the covenant. Now, the next big theme of the Bible, the theme of poetry, the theme of poetry. And there are five, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. These songs and poetry describe God's greatness and his dealings with men. It's beautiful because it's a genre, isn't it? It's like the people of Israel would memorize these songs and sing them to their children and they would memorize it and then they would share that with their next generation. And these songs would talk about not only God's character, but also there are so many prophecies of the Messiah coming too. And Proverbs were very powerful words of wisdom, uh, mostly by Solomon. Ecclesiastes talks about his wisdom in terms of the fut futility of life without God. Um, and the Song of Solomon, also a love story, but really talking about God's love for us. The next big uh, section is about prophets, major prophets, minor prophets. Do you know the difference between major and minor? Why is it called major and minor? It's not that these prophets were more important, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. It's just that these five books, written between 750 and 550, are longer in length than the other ones. That's the only reason, okay? <laughs> so Isaiah has like 50 chapters or 60 chapters, and Jeremiah has a lot of chapters. So that's the reason why they're called major. But these books of prophecy talk about, first of all, Israel, how they're going to fall into captivity. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. But inside of those prophecies are also prophecies of the coming Messiah. That's why it is so powerful. The minor prophets are many more, and they are shorter in length. And they're coming towards the end of um, the book of I mean, the Old Testament. Can I, can I show the next slide? Okay, so the minor prophets, there are 12. They are written between 840 and 400 BC. They are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So we don't hear these as often because they are very short books, but they are very powerful stories and powerful prophecies towards Israel Warning them, the more you fall away of the covenant, you're going to get destroyed. But don't worry, the Savior's coming. That's that's kind of the whole prophecy. So all these books make 39. Then there were there was about 400 years of quietness and darkness. God did not reveal any revelations until the Roman government controlled everything. And finally, we see the coming of Christ, right? The New Testament. So the New Testament has how many books? 27 books. And what's in the New Testament? Summary of that is number one here. Life of Christ. The way of salvation. The beginning of Christianity as a whole. Instruction for Christian living. And even God's plan for the future. For us, the New Testament is absolutely important. There are still some believers who think that the Old Testament is more important or that we have to like abide by all those rules. And then there are some Christians who say, forget the Old Testament. We don't need it. No, 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 no. We need all of it. 
And that's called the whole counsel of God. We need the whole counsel of God for us to grow in our faith and to understand the gospel. But specifically for Christian living, after Jesus came and rose again, these New Testament books are very important. So there are five books of history, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts. These are books of history. So what's Matthew all about? Let's read that. June, you want to read Matthew? Written for Jews are waiting for the Messiah. Yes. Mark. Um, Jesus as servant of God for Roman world. Mm -hmm. Luke, Jesus as the perfect man for the Greek world. John, Jesus as the son of God, evangelistic. Max, beginning of Christian church. Yeah, that's a very summary, brief summary of these four books. And there are books that all talk about the life of Jesus while he was born. Some emphasize some other things than others. And that's why this is how theologians have summarized the entire book. Um, but they are firsthand witness, witness accounts of the life of Jesus. And we would not know anything about him unless we had these books, right? Um, that's why they're so precious to us, because we can know the character and the words of Jesus, and it's written down. But the following set of books are called letters, right? So the 21 books as a whole, they are written to individuals, also to entire churches, and also to set like groups of believers in general. How many are from Paul? Does anyone know? Can you guess? 17? 17? Uh, no. Yeah, that, yeah, it's in the teens, that's for sure. There's 13, 13 Paul's letters. And some people say it's 14, but there are, you know, people don't agree sometimes of who wrote the book of Hebrews. But Paul wrote Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus, and Philemon. <laughs> so he wrote a lot. And that is like so much content for us to grow in our faith, right? The theology there, the organization. I and mean, Paul was so important in teaching us the life of a Christian. And especially because there's so many false teachings at that time. And even today, there's so much false teaching. So we have to go back to these very important letters and understand properly what the gospel means. So, but there are other letters, right? What about the rest, the eight, the eight other books? The eight other books are general letters, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. We also have uh, Jude. Okay, the number's all funky right now, but sorry. So there are eight of these. And of course, other than Hebrews, these are the author's names. James wrote James, 1st and 2nd Peter, Peter wrote. Okay, but we don't know who wrote Hebrews. We're not really sure. That's why people just say it's kind of like anonymous. But the last genre is Revelation, which is prophecy. It's a book of prophecy. It's talking about return of Christ, the reign of Christ, the glory of Christ, and the future state of believers and non-believers. So this is the only book that hasn't been fully fulfilled. But you have to know the genre of prophecy. There's so much imagery and symbolism. And a lot of them is bringing from the Old Testament, the Old Testament symbolism so people sometimes take it really really literally and then they are trying to interpret the book of revelation based on today's time but we have to be very careful to do that because it was written back then so it's not written about helicopters and tanks and you know like it's not written like in terms of that being fulfilled in that way okay but Anyway, that's the whole entire Bible in a nutshell. Okay, but it does seem like it's like a puzzle, right? <laughs> it's like, ah, how do I understand all these pieces? And as you remember from VBS, okay, all those puzzle pieces, yes, there are very many pieces, but they all tell a central theme, right? What's the central theme? The key is Jesus, of course. How do we know that? This is a powerful verse that reminds us. Luke 24, 7, 27. Grace, you want to read it? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Yes. So Jesus talking to the two people, to two disciples going to Emmaus, he was explaining, beginning with Moses. And what's that? The five books of Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, major and minor prophets. He's interpreting to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So he's trying to tell them, hey, did you know that Genesis is talking about me? Exodus, Leviticus, they're all talking about me, the Christ to come. Beautiful verse that describes that. And also he says in John 5, 20, 539, you want to read that, Grace? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, they bear witness about me. Yeah. He's actually telling the Pharisees, hey, you're studying this so much, but you don't really know that it's really pointing to me. And that's such a blessing that we can know that. You know, even knowing it is a grace of God. It's not because we're smart and we figured it out on our own. It's God's grace. So I love this picture. Have you seen this before? about prophecies of the Old Testament and how it's all connected and linked to fulfillment in the new. All these lines, okay? <laughs> it's so crazy, right? So if you see the lines in the arc, arcs of the line, the yellow colors, it could mean, you know, the, I mean, all the different colors have different meanings, but um, for example, I will, I will show you what it really means. Um, I'll do a, a close-up of that. Where is it? The, the orange color is what the Messiah will be like. The dark orange is, is, is prophecies about the lineage of the Messiah. Gray is the need for a Messiah. Red is his character. Pink is how he will come. And gray is how will he how he will be received. Blue is what will he say, what he will say. Green, uh, turquoise, what he will do. Light blue, how others will respond. Dark green, how he will redeem. And green, how it will end. And then if it's dotted, dotted, it's the claim of Jesus. If it's lined, um, like dotted lines, affirmation by others. And a straight line is a record of an event. So this is this is somebody... Somebody organized it in this way to show the connection of the old and the new. They're just, it's not just random stories, but they all connect. Beautiful, isn't it? So all of this to say that the scriptures point to Jesus. How he is the, the, the main, main uh, character. Old Testament is pointing to him, prophesying him who is to come. New Testament says he's here. And what happens to those who believe? John 20, 31 is a beautiful verse. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It's not enough to just know that Jesus is the main character. We have to believe it. Believe that he's the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And when I believe, that's when we have eternal life. So why is the word of God so important to us? Why is it so important that we know it and share it, and especially with children? June, do you want to read this one? 2 Timothy 3.15, and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah. This is why it's so important for us to share the gospel with children. We cannot force them to believe. But when they know the word of God and the word of God is rooted in them and they hear it, it will, that's the word of God that brings them salvation because they can't be saved if they don't have special revelation from God. But God will not save them as they're just walking along in the desert. Like they have to know the gospel. That's why it's so important for us to relay it to them. Maybe they're not ready to accept now or their faith is not real now, but it's so powerful what the word of God does. It's like a seed in someone's heart. And this verse is powerful for us who want to be disciples of Christ. Grace, you want to read? 
So Jesus said to Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Mm -hmm. True disciples not only believe, but they abide in the word. They remain in the word. They live by the word of God. So even Jesus said that to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this word of God is how we live. It's our bread. It's our, it's our meat. It's our water. You know, it's our light. It's our life. The word of God is the way to become a true disciple. So when we say God's word alone or sola scriptura, inside of that is this, the new Testament is in the old Testament concealed, right? Everything that we know about Jesus in the new Testament is already in the old. It's just hidden. It's something that needs to be revealed. And then in the new, the old is in the New Testament, revealed. I love this little phrase, okay? The new is in the old, concealed. The old is in the new, revealed. And I like how one of my professors explained it. He says, think about, there's a room in a house, fully furnished and everything, and you walk into the room, but it's so dim. The lights are not on. You can faintly see that there's a sofa over here. There's a there's a, a TV over here. You can't really see it, but it's there. Not only until the light is turned on, can you see all of the furniture in its position? He says that in Genesis, we already see the Christ is there. Genesis 3.15, right? We see the Christ is there when God calls Abraham. We see the Christ in, in the sacrifices. We see the Christ in the covenant. We see the Christ in uh, in the sacrifice of Isaac or the near sacrifice of Isaac, right? But we don't understand that it's actually about Jesus. So it's kind of like that dimly lit room, but it's all there. And God doesn't reveal it until later, little by little. And that's why the more we know the word of God, the more powerful and transforming it is because it's not something new. It's already there. So a way to describe what the Bible is, is the unfolding story, the unfolding. I like that term unfolding. It's unfolding. It's being revealed little by little unfolding story of God's plan of redemption for mankind through Jesus Christ. It, it's not a development of God's idea of salvation. It's just the unfolding plan of God that he had from the very beginning. So what's the prayer that we should have concerning the word of God? I wrote three prayers. Why don't we read it together and make it our own? Ready? Give me a, Give teachable, me a heart. teachable heart to learn more oh, about God. God's word. Amen? Yes. We always need to have a teachable heart and have a humble heart when we come before the Lord. No matter how many years we've studied it or what degrees we have in theology, it's a humble heart a teachable heart, because there's no way that we will know fully the, the heart of God. He has to give us revelation by the Holy Spirit. Second prayer. Ready? Give me faith to believe in God's word 100%. This is also the grace of God to believe it. If you don't believe it, then, you know, what can you do to change yourself? God has to give you faith to really believe and hold it as covenant, as promise. And the last is also so important. Give me strength to obey God's word. Because faith without works is dead, right? Which in other words, when we have faith given to us by God's grace, it takes place or it is activated in our obedience to God. And every single day is a day to draw closer to him and know him more. And today at Dreamland Preschool, the message that I shared was about the Bible is God's word. And for the littlest ones who are only two years old, I just showed them the Bible that look, opens up like a book and showed them a heart box. And then inside the heart box was the love letter, right? And it's written Jesus on it. I think that's the most simple way to explain what the Bible is. It is God's love letter to us telling us that he loves us and proving it to us, showing it to us 
by sending his son, Jesus. So like a love letter, we need to read it. <laughs> we need to read it and savor it, enjoy it. And for the older kids, I showed them the honey little bottle. And I said, did you know in Psalm 19, it says the word is sweeter than honey? How can anything be sweeter than honey? It's like the sweetest thing. But the word is sweeter than honey to our soul. It should satisfy you more than any other chocolate or dessert out there. It's the sweetest thing. And we need to fill our hearts with that. Amen.